Let me introduce you Dr. Nicolette Makovitsky. Um, she's a lecturer in Russian and East European Studies at the University of Oxford. Um, what can I tell about, about Nicolette? I think some of you have already met Nicolette. She has been to Poland quite, a, quite many times, right? In our <laughs> institute, as I figured out, at least two times. Um, in, well, a couple of years ago and three years ago. Uh, so Nicolette publishes on themes such as labor, informal economics, economic favor, gender, citizenship. She's an editor and co-editor of two edited volumes. One of the, we, both of them are in our library. One of them is Neoliberalism, Personhood and Post-Socialism, Enterprising Selves and uh, changing economy, in Changing Economies, right? Uh, and the other one is the brand new book, I hope you will have the little picture of the book. No, I don't, unfortunately. Unfortunately, the book was taken from our library or somebody. Uh, but it's, it has a beautiful full cover. Well, never mind, we'll Google that afterwards. It's called Economies of Favor After, after uh, Socialism. Uh, Nicolas has done field work in Slovakia, UK, and of course, Poland. So that's, that's, that's our topic for today. Okay, I will not make that too long. The floor is yours. And Thank you for coming, first of all. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and I'm always happy to present and always slightly nervous to present here um, because inevitably I end up presenting something on Poland to Polish anthropologists, um, which is a bit daunting. Um, today I'm going to be talking about Ostsepek and its fakes. And this is work uh, that I've done uh, based on field work that was mainly done in the summer of 2015 uh, with shepherds in the Polish highlands um, over the course of, of the summer. And uh, the project was looking uh, interested in kind of the, mostly the policy side. So how shepherds were uh, running their businesses and taking advantage of, uh, of EU subsidies and what kind of organizational power they needed to have in order to tap into these resources. But while uh, I was there with my research assistant, we noticed something very interesting. And often as it is, you know, when you're doing field work, you think you're gonna study one thing and something else pops up. And the thing that really struck us was the amount of what one might call fake Ostsevek that is being sold and made um, in the area. And uh, the fact that uh, Ostsepek has a uh, protected designation of origin from the EU uh, has made absolutely no difference to this. Um, so really, one of the things that we ended up um, discussing at length with, with shepherds, but also thinking for ourselves, um, is why doesn't this work? You know, Ostsepek has a PDO, this should give it legal protection, um, and this should, you know, uh, ensure that, uh, that uh, shepherds are getting a good price for their Ostsepek, and uh, that all these other cheeses are, are sort of uh, relegated to it, or, or controlled, um, and it's not, it's not happening. So really this whole article, or this whole, it, what, what is hopefully going to be an article, um, but this whole talk is kind of our thoughts about why this, is, why this isn't happening. So why has the PDO failed in, in this instance? Um, and I, I should say that uh, my research assistant, Pavel Sendika, who is doing a, a PhD uh, at the Jagiellonian uh, on shepherding, contemporary shepherds, um, contributed uh, to, to, of course, the field work, but also to the writing of the original text that, that the, the talk is uh, based on. So just uh, before I start um, to talk a little bit about what PDOs and PGIs are, um, I don't know how much of this legislation you're aware of, uh, but these, uh, these labels or brands were launched in 1992, uh, they're called geographical indicators, and they form a kind of important part of the European wider effort by European institutions and different kinds of interest groups to protect local foods and traditional cuisines from the market strength of kind of industrial agriculture and agro-food businesses. And they link food production or artisanal food production to positively valued notions of territory and cultural heritage. 
and they're designed to offer small-scale producers legal protection from unfair competition by counterfeit or derivative goods. Um, and the scheme is built around the premise that the quality and characteristics of certain foods can be attributed to the physical place of their origin. And it offers three different categories of registration, expressing kind of tighter or increasingly tighter connection between place of origin, ingredients, traditional methods of production. So you have traditional specialty guaranteed, uh, which is that one, uh, which is kind of the lowest grade. Uh, then you have protected geographical indication and protected designation of origin, which is the, the kind of tightest connection. Um, and in the case of artisanal cheeses, the PDO, so the protected designation of origin, is granted where the physical characteristics of landscape, together with the local tradition, are believed to provide the product with its distinctive qualities. And all three ca categories carry, uh, of, of all three of these categories, it carries the most stringent criteria for guaranteeing the authenticity of a product, demanding that cheeses are produced and processed and prepared in the given location using recognized traditional knowledge, as well as specifying the milk is obtained by heritage breeds or from heritage breeds, consuming only locally sourced feed. And all of this is, is regularly uh, monitored. Uh, PDO certification thus works to codify the recipe and the methods for making a particular cheese and transforming it into a kind of intellectual property, which is bound to a certain territory and to certain bodies, so physical bodies of people making, but also institutional bodies. And to date, uh, Polish pastoralists have obtained a protected designation of origin uh, for three highland cheeses, which is Brinza Podhalanska, uh, Redikolka, which is the small ones, and of course, Ostebek. Um, and remember this image. It's one of the few images of these products where you can actually see the labels uh, very nicely displayed, and kind of there's, they're made of, uh, something, you know, something is made of these labels. So according to the European Commission, geographical indications have the potential to support rural development uh, and create value for local communities by protecting products that are deeply rooted in tradition, culture, and geography. And that's a quote from the European Commission's website. Um, if you look at the scholarship on geographical indication and, and GI foods, uh, there's a lot of discussion and debate among scholars uh, whether this is actually achieved through the process of, of this kind of labeling. So some studies show that geographical indicators do uh, have the potential to provide a kind of legal or commercial basis uh, for socioeconomic development um, because they embed production in a kind of local context um, and they can protect producers from extra local market actors by discouraging commercial misappropriation of things like product names, so you can't call other things Ostebeck, um, controlling supply and discouraging or and, and erecting kind of high barriers to entry of entry to the market. On the other hand, many people write about how such schemes actually lead to different new forms of social and economic exclusion. So, for example, when producers lack control over the certification process, a lot of the tacit knowledge of local actors might be expropriated by large-scale manufacturers outside the community or even appropriated by local elites within the community. Um, and people also write about how you know, making tradition and authenticity something that you can audit uh, is, is reducing it uh, very much to a, a kind of, sort of, it reduces the certification process and reduces uh, the diversity of local food cultures to a kind of tick boxing exercise. And this can kind of curtail the ability for artisans to improvise and innovate uh, on the ground. So a lot of the scholarship really talks about how communities adopt geographical indications, but sometimes lose out in terms of their agency as producers. Um, and this kind of perspective, I think, offers a legitimate critique of the asymmetries of power which exist between small-time producers and bureaucracies and large market players. Um, but there are some holes uh, in, in looking at it this way. Um, often uh, you have a, a kind of overstating, I think, of the power of external actors in the community and overlooking the kind of potential for, for uh, for conflict and predatory behavior within communities themselves. And that's very much a, a, a kind of trait of 
of what happens in the case of the Ostapec. Um, there's, there's not just competition from outside, it's very much within the community that people are producing um, imitation cheeses. And there's also a ten tendency to conflate regulation with practice. So these, this kind of saying that if we certify things, then you know people will be locked into making certain kinds of cheeses, um, and viewing codification and certification as a kind of end to a natural development and transmission of knowledge. Um, and at least in, in what I've seen in in Portugal and other places, that's not necessarily true. Um, a lot of anthropological studies have shown that. Uh, kind of imposition of internal or external directives of different kinds don't always result in the loss of agency on the part of producers. So producers can resist different aspects of certification um, and may even force the, the kind of to change the, the parameters of authenticity. Or in one case I've read, uh, they actually use the certification process to dump goods which they saw as less authentic and less uh, less uh, interesting uh, on the PDO market, so they actually got certification for cheese, which they then would not eat themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so they can be a, a kind of a good vehicle um, in that way. Um, and so there is some research also that looks at the way that concepts like tradition and authenticity are a matter of debate and conflict within communities, as well as between communities and external actors. But one of the interesting things, I think, is that despite the fact that you have a lot of these studies of geographical indications and their effects on producers, um, most of these don't actually address the question of geography or the question of place. Um, so there's a lot about you know, tussles over certification and who gets, to, uh, who gets to set the parameters of certification and who benefits from certification. Um, but not very much uh, about uh, ideas of place, actually. Um, and it's quite curious because the entire idea of geographical indications rests on this notion of place, the notion of, of terroir, that is the notion that you have distinct ecologies of production that generate distinct sensory qualities in handcrafted agricultural products. And the notion of terroir comes from uh, or was first employed by the French to link viticulture, so grape growing, to a character of wine. Um, and it's sort of understood as the taste of place. So it refers to the material conditions of a locale, the soil, the topography, the microclimate, as well as the cultural know-how behind agricultural products that help constitute place as a locus of shared custom and effective belonging. And translating this into cheese making, terroir really covers everything from the way pasture lands, uh, the, the flora and fauna found on pasture lands that are used to, to graze sheep, um, to practices of animal husbandry, um, to different kinds of microorganisms that go into to the cheese, um, different recipes and different artisanal methods of production. And as I show, Polish uh, pastoralists really think and speak about cheese in this kind of way. So they kind of think about it in terms also of, of the, the biodiversity, the character of the landscape, even though they don't actually use the terminology of terroir uh, particularly. But terroir is not just about taste. It's also uh, a kind of ideological trope. Um, and it separates what's traditionally and understood as traditionally fabricated agricultural food products, such as cheese and wine and different kinds of meats, from industrially manufactured products. And it links these traditional foods to ideas of region, to ideas of national patrimony. So, in other words, it's also a tool for adding value to products in a very competitive market, and it's a way of signaling the idea that this food product is a product of a kind of morally and environmentally superior values-based form of production. So it's about much more than a good quality cheese. Um, and much of the work done on GI foods and particularly on artisanal cheese, tend to concentrate on the way that producers interpret and attempt to broadcast these notions of terroir or notions of connection to landscape, um, rather than the question of whether consumers are receptive to the message. Um, and for example, uh, in, in her work, uh, 
um, artisanal cheesemakers in the US, Heather Paxson argues that it may not matter whether cheesemakers are successful in conveying their understanding of the value of what they're doing to consumers as long as the cheese sells at the price which fairly compensates artisan labor, whether the, on taste alone or with appreciation for its instrumental values, producers' goals um, in reproducing their everyday life are furthered. But I'm going to argue that actually, at least in case of Ostepec, it very much does matter whether these values are broadcast to consumers and how they are interpreted by consumers. And that's the entire premise of the, P, of the PDO, or uh, Geographical Indications Labeling. It's the notion that such values are recognized by consumers who are going to confer a higher symbolic value to such goods and this will generate enough demand amongst those who are willing to pay a premium price um, that, uh, that is needed to cover the relatively higher cost of producing uh, cheese in this way. And furthermore, given that such values are associated with a market premium, there's always the danger that other producers may try to manufacture a similar but cheaper product which emulates the characteristics of a geographical indication food in order to take advantage of this kind of makeup or markup. Uh, so recent research shows how European and American consumers unwittingly buy a lot of counterfeit goods uh, which misappropriate the rep reputational value of geographical indications. So there's a lot of olive oils which are adulterated, but not olive oils at all. There's a lot of mislabeled cheeses and, and so on. And if consumers fail to recognize uh, geographical indication labels or understand the values, that they're meant to convey, they might not just deceive themselves into thinking that they bought a high quality product, but they actually undermine the livelihoods of those um, producers who, who manufactured the original. And so the, in the following, I'm going to explore how this kind of process happens uh, with Ostepec cheese uh, in, in, uh, by, made by shepherds in Potthalle, in Tatras, Pienini, in Gorze, and some other places that, that we were looking at. Um, and so I'm interested in looking actually at the relationship between the geographical indication of Zemeck and all the imitations uh, that, that are floating around the market. So I'm going to talk a lot about the imitations, not necessarily so much about the original. Um, and I also want to shed some critical light on this notion of the place uh, of origin and terroir as a kind of unproblematic way of using or creating value in the economic and the social sense for traditional foods and producers. And I think actually in the case of Ostebeck, it's precisely the kind of tight historical and symbolic association of the cheese with the region and the mountain landscape, which ends up undermining the market strength for, for the PDO uh, certified version. So I'm not gonna go too much into uh, a description of what Ostebeck is. For the article, we have quite a long description for people who don't know. Uh, but of course, it's a, it's a smoked uh, sheep's cheese or mixed sheep and cow's cheese uh, that's made in, in the mountains in southern Poland um, and is produced by hand uh, by shepherds, Batsas, and their assistant, Juhasi, in shepherds' huts located in the pastures. And it's a product that's very seasonal, so it's made between May and September. Um, and despite having a, a kind of set production method, the Ostebeck produced by different shepherds can give, uh, can differ significantly in terms of color and texture and taste. Uh, so Batsa can introduce a lot of variation in the production process by adjusting the proportion of cows to sheep's milk or by changing the temperatures during production or the length of time that a cheese is smoked. Um, and also, because it's made in the Batsovka, um, in the kind of mountains, the Ostebeck reflects the characteristics of the surrounding natural environment. So the sheep graze on pastures with different kinds of grass covers and herbal compositions, uh, varying exposure to sunlight, uh, and vegetation that changes over the course of the season. And all of these kinds of factors, including things like when there's a drought or, or a lot of rain, influence the flavor, flavor of the finished product. Um, and so you have, uh, for example, a, a, a batsa called Buczek, uh, where it's, it works in Ochot Mitzah Gurna, uh, talked about you know, cheese making and pastoralism. He talked about it as making a painting. And what is beautiful is that, is that you're the one who can choose the colors, the people, the animals, the grazing, the pasture. 
And the way you're going to paint this picture is the way it's going to be. So he thinks about it as a kind of composition. And he actually, uh, in our interview, he actually c compared cheese, Austrian cheese, and the, the variations of taste directly to wine and the variations of taste in, in wines. But of course, the great, greatest variation in taste and texture is caused by the ratio of sheep's milk to cow's milk in the finished product. And here you can see uh, purely sheep's uh, cheese on the top and more and more and more cow's milk added in the finished product um, towards towards the, the end there. The lightest one is, is the most, uh, has the most cow's milk in it. Um, and if you read the ethnography, traditionally, most of it, cheese was purely made uh, at the end of the grazing season in August and September when the fat content of milk was at its peak, uh, but when the yields were actually the smallest. Um, and it was designed to last through the winter and form part of the remuneration received by Bukasi for their labor throughout the season. Um, and it wasn't something that was made uh, for general sale. Um, although Specifically around Zakahane, um, they were, you know, shepherds were selling, uh, uh, were selling Ostepec, um as as far back as the early nineteenth, uh, the early twentieth century. Um, so, if you read some of the, the the literature, this is just to show, you know, this idea of terroir. Um, actually, this this. Is, this is where the, the shepherd sleeps at night uh, in order to make sure that the wolves aren't getting to the sheep. Um, so if you read the literature, um, people set uh, the, the kind of, or, or there's, there's the, the idea of a kind of ostepec as a commercial product, so not just as a product for, for, for shepherds themselves. Um, is more or less uh, set in the 1990s. So in response to grow growing demand uh, for cheese from visitors and, and tourists, local shepherds began to produce Ostepec throughout the grazing season uh, for the local market. And the 1990s is also where you see Ostepec being made beyond Pothal and the Tatras uh, in, in, in larger amounts. And this kind of commercialization of tradition encountered some basic structural problems. So first of all, uh, there was a steep fall in the number of sheep uh, in the late 1980s for completely different reasons, and so there was less milk going around to make cheese. Um, and second of all, of course, the peak tourist season in the Tatras is wintertime, which is the opposite of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, the pastoral cycle. Um, so, Adamski and Golak have written about this, talk about how this is the time where you start seeing these, the, the emergence of these kinds of fakes. Um, the, the issue of a lack of milk and, and demand being at the wrong time of year was, was they say, uh, was um, kind of solved by partially or totally substituting sheep's milk with cow's milk in the production process. Um, and this meant that Ostebic cheese could be made outside of the grazing season, um, and also that it, you could in a sense, dispense with pastoral agriculture itself because cow's milk uh, cheeses could be made any time of the year. Um, and working shepherds began at that point to really get a, a kind of competition from other parties seeking to take advantage of the growing status of Ostebec as a marketable regional specialty. So local farmers using locally available unpasteurized cow's milk to produce cheeses resembling Ostebec um, for the tourist market. And this is where you start getting a push to somehow certify uh, the original Ostebec uh, in, in some way to and give people uh, this, this uh, legal protection. So uh, in 1996, the Regional Association of Sheep and Goat Breeders in Novitar uh, sought to codify the traditional recipe and method of Ostebec uh, from, making for, uh, from sheep's milk, that is exclusively sheep's milk. Um, and they gained certification in 2003, um, they, that is, they gained a Polish patent in 2003, uh, after the legislation of the production and sale of unpasteurized cheeses uh, for the Polish market was, was passed. So actually, they weren't allowed to sell this uh, cheese before um, 2003. But of course, in 2003, you're on the cusp of joining the EU. Um, and once this happened, uh, the, they, they needed to then uh, convert the Polish patent into a uh, geographical indication, um, and they, uh, they then 
put forward uh, an application uh, to get a, a PDO certification for OSTEPEC, which they got in 2008. Um, there's a lot to say about that in terms of arguments with the Slovaks and, and other kind of matters, but I'll, I'll skip that. So Adamski and Golak wrote their article just before certification, and they assumed that certification would basically put an end to what they called the, the popular Ostepec, so this, this cow's milk imitation. Um, and they write that it will signal the end of the production of the popular, that is, the cow's milk versions for the tourist market. And this just hasn't happened. We're 10 years after certification, um, and imitation cow's milk cheeses still continue to dominate the tourist market and the restoration business in, in the Carpathians and, and beyond. Um, and so the failure of certification to put an end of the production of imitations can to a certain extent be uh, attributed to the unwillingness of the authorities to prosecute those who actually flout the rules. I mean, there's lots of people who are making this in various degrees of, 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 of fakery. Um, there's also, um, you know, and as, I, as I'll show now, but there's no willingness on a local level, regional level, or even national level to, to kind of enforce this. And neither are shepherds themselves who are very well aware of other people making imitations. You know, they, they don't have an appetite to actually go and, and kind of rat on people either. Um, but I think it's very much still predicated on this kind of market dynamic that was set up in the 1990s with a kind of high demand for cheese and uh, a restricted, uh, a restricted sort of supply of the original. But also, to add to this, there's a profound lack of consumer awareness of the PDO designation on the criteria upon which is, it's given on the, on the part of, of cons consumers. And this creates a kind of gray space in the market, which is populated not just by fake Ostrepec, but what I would call a kind of wider ecolo ecology of cow's milk cheeses. And some of these are out, uh, kind of outright fakes. Um, others are authentic local products with their own right uh, to enjoy their own kind of lesser certification as traditional products or as regional products. And some of these are even made by pastoralists themselves in the winter time. So it's it's a real kind of mess. Um, and I want to just talk a little bit about this kind of market for for fakes. Here we go. So. In 2011, uh, uh, my, my, uh, my research assistant was witness to a discussion between uh, a lady called Helena, or we, we call her Helena, and a priest. And Helena's a woman in her late 50s, uh, and she and her husband make uh, part of their living by selling cow's milk cheeses as Ostepek or Serki Buranske uh, in, uh, in a street in central Krakow. Uh, she resides in a village located about 80 kilometers away in the Podhalle, and she sources her products from a third party, travels to the city on weekdays, and stands next to a kind of improvised stall, which is just a basket, uh, on, on a stool on one of the busiest pedestrian thoroughfares in the old town. And the meeting between Helena and this priest was you know, just of an informal kind of nature. The priest was off duty and over for a friendly visit with one of her neighbors. And as cups of tea and shots of vodka helped the atmosphere to become more relaxed, she finally asked him a question that looked like it must have been gnawing at her for some time. Father, she said, when I say they're sheep cheeses, is it already a lie or is it just salesmanship? <laughs> So the stall run by Helena and her husband is one of hundreds which can be found dotted across mountain areas of southern Poland, often consisting of little more than a collapsible table. They're set along roadsides near the entrance to national parks, at train stations, markets, and in the centers of local towns. And of course, in popular highland tourist destinations such as Zakopane, residents and commercial outlets rent out space in courtyards and doorways for stall holders seeking to take advantage of football from visitors. The city authorities also rent out a number of fixed, elaborately decorated stalls to individuals on a yearly basis. And the variety of local hard cheeses are sold by these vendors for cash and, stall, uh, and often without a printed receipt. Um, which, of course, means you can't trace any of these things for tax purposes. Um, so the most widely sold 
product is the Golka, a rather nondescript cooked smoked cylindrical cheese, which can be made out of a blend of sheep's and cow's milk, but most often is composed purely of cow's milk. It's one of these. Oh, and by the way, I bought this picture off the internet, and it said traditional Ostsebeck in Zakopane. So, okay, so you can already see the confusion here. Um, many also sell the bite-sized flat-smoked uh, Redkolka, or a cheese made to resemble it. And you can see those right there. Um, as pop, which is a popular snack amongst visitors. And finally, some stall holders also sell large fusiform cheeses which resemble Ostefek, although most avoid openly labeling, labeling them as such. Indeed, because the names of the last two cheeses are subject to, um, to protection by virtue of PDO certification, vendors frequently forgo labels altogether or describe their products using generic names such as Serek Batsovsky or Serek Gazdowski. So here you can see, I don't know if you can see that very well, but all of the cheeses have sort of descriptions uh, of how they taste, but they have no names written on them. And I think that's very, yeah, that's very sort of um, strategic. So stockholders, in other words, rarely you know, openly contravene the law by selling outright fakes. Rather, as Helena's comment above suggests, they present consumers with a cheerful invitation to practice self-deception. A number of Polish dairies tread the same fine line uh, between mere suggestion and outright deception by producing cheeses which strongly resemble Ostebeck and other protected regional cheeses in color and in shape. Made from pasteurized cow's milk, these cheeses are distributed and sold throughout major supermarket change, chains under the names such as Tsipek or Wostsipek or other kinds of derivations and marketed using symbolic markers and taglines which are designed to give the consumer an impression of authenticity. And I think that this is a really good example of this. This is of course uh, by, by Lekovita, which is Poland's largest dairy group, and they have this line called Zakopanskie Speciali, um, which is marketed with this English phrase, specialties from, English, from Polish mountains. Um, and different different cheeses, uh, which they all label Golka, which, which are clearly uh, in the shape of other highland uh, cheeses. And so these products are designed to take advantage from the reputation of the Ostebeck and other certified cheeses. Um, and these dairies manage to evade uh, prosecution by basically you know, manipulating uh, uh, various different uh, different uh, kind of aspects of it. So, for example. They couldn't write Ostebeck on the lay on the on the package, um, even though they're kind of symbolically indicating that this is an Ostebeck. If they wrote Ostebeck on it, they would be contravening the law. Um, so most of these things don't you know don't actually cross the line and, and become illegal. The only exception is a producer of a cheese called uh, O and, and an exclamation point sip which came under investigation not for the name itself, but for the description on its label, which included the prohibited phrase, Ostepec type cheese. Um, so whether sold in roadside stalls or in supermarkets, such cow's milk cheeses are not simply outright Ostepec fakes, but they're examples of what uh, an Italian scholar called Cicarelli has called avatar products. So avatars are an inexpensive imitation which reproduces the taste and appearance of the original product using cheaper ingredients while taking on the signs and symbolic values of the authentic product. And you can see clearly how they're kind of um, taking these signs on here um, in, in references to sort of full costume and all of this. So the product of economies of scales, avatars are promoted as the fruit of artisanal uh, traditions uh, rooted in the local area, but they don't share the intrinsic qualities like smell, taste, and, and, uh, and reputation of the original. And avatar products are characteristic of very highly segmented markets. They appear where there's a shortfall in the supply of the original, or where consumer demand is both high and differentiated in terms of spending power. And in the case of, of geographical indication of foods, um, avatar products arise when manufacturers seek to reproduce or take advantage of the reputation of the original as a premium good while eschewing the relatively high costs of actually uh, making the uh, or using the traditional production methods. But I think what's interesting is that uh, Kekarelli emphasizes that it's not 
just predatory behavior um, on the side of commercial actors, but also that there's certain systemic contradictions that distinguish the market and the production of geographical indication products, which means that you get this kind of segmented market with, with originals sort of on the top and, and, and these imitations uh, following them. And first of all, he writes, uh, while the geographical indication scheme aims to guarantee the quality and reputation of traditional goods by specifying their ingredients and method of manufacture, the certification process works to reinforce already existing constraints on production. So a product made according to regulations becomes available in very small quantities and its production costs and market price are relatively high and this itself opens up the market for imitations. And secondly, he writes, avatars uh, might pose a competitive, competitive threat to geographical indication products and their manufacturers um, and their popularity, but their popularity, that is the popularity of the avatars, is ultimately dependent on the reputation of the original. So while the production and sale of avatars involves a much higher turnover and often distant markets to the original uh, geographical uh, indication certified product, the, the original provides the necessary kind of symbolic element which drives the demand. So it's because people want the original that they, they buy the avatar. So Kekarelli really sees the, uh, the, the kind of avatar as having an overall positive effect on local economies and at the same time as actually not being a threat to the original um, because um, you know, the avatar makes a product available to a larger uh, range of consumers uh, which purchase a product which carries some of the social status and symbolic value of the original, um, but it allows the original in a sense to still create value across the entire product line. Now in the case of Ostebeck, this is precisely not what happens. Um, so you have a continued presence of cow's milk avatars on the market, and this seems to exercise a downward pressure on the price of the original, rather than existing as a kind of lower priced variation or alternative to the original. So when proponents of, the certi of certification in 2007 suggested that designation would push uh, the price of PDO certified Ostebeck up to 10 euros a piece, um, that's about 42 zloty when I checked last. <coughs> Shepherds are forced to sell their Ostipki more around 25 to 30 zloty a piece. And that's the same price as local smallholders charge for the cow's milk uh, equivalents. So they're actually not getting a, a premium. So contrary to the intentions of the geographical indication quality scheme um, and to Kekarelli's model of the, of the GI market, um, they're unable to earn a premium on their cheese. And in the following sections, I look at three different reasons why this is. And in the first section, I'm, I'm going to talk about um, the sheer size of the market for this avatars and the apparent disinterest of the authorities uh, in policing the, the practices and claims of stallholders. Um, and the other is the lack of consumer awareness of different types of traditional highland cheeses, um, of their texture and their taste. Now, it's really difficult, by the way, that over there, it says Batsovsky, and they're clearly shaped to be Ostipki, so you can see already where there's these blunt, these kind of, you know, fiddling with, with uh, shapes and forms and, and some, you know, symbolic uh, sides of of, of different cheeses. Um, it's difficult to kind of get a grasp of how big the market for these, for these avatars actually is. Uh, local national dairies don't publish any information on the product and turnover, production and turnover of the product lines. I have tried uh, many times to get hold of Nekovica to ask them actually how many of these, uh, of these cheeses they produce, but they haven't answered. Um, and the local cottage industry, which supplies stallholders like Helena, remains pretty much unregulated and informal, and thus statistically invisible. Um, it is possible to get a rough indication of the volume of cow's milk cheeses produced locally by calculating the turnover of the official stalls rented out in the city of Zakopane. So we actually sat down and, and worked out the, the following. Um, located in the city's open air market on, on the main tourist fair, uh, these kiosks are allocated to vendors through an annual lottery. 
And in 2016, the price of a monthly lease on one of these stalls varied between 13,680 and 19,200 zloty per month, earning the local authorities a total of 141,887 zloty every month. I suspect one of the reasons they don't check whether these are real to P is because it's such a nice rumor. Um, so renting the two most expensive kiosks, uh, one single vendor in 2016 was reported to be paying a combined rent of 38,000 zloty. And this stallholder alone needed to sell at least 1,500 cheeses a month, uh, or 18,000 a year at the average price of an Ostsebeck for 25 zloty, in order to break even. Um, so that's quite a lot of cheeses that you just need to sell in these two in these two stands. And a little later, I'll talk about kind of calculations of how many uh, PDO certified uh, OCP that there probably are uh, every year, or probably produced every year. So eighteen thousand a year in just two stalls. Um, so the manufacture and resale or sale of cow's milk cheeses supports a kind of unknown number of locals forming a rather integral but pretty much unaccountable part of the regional economy. And Highland shepherds are pretty much aware of what's going on and they regard this cottage industry as a predatory practice which threatens the viability of their own production. They frequently make their own rough calculations of units moved and income earned by those involved. Um, so Baxa Stach, who works in the Gotha, told us that he was acquainted with a villager who sold, according to him, 300 cow's milk ostipi a day, and this is how he put it, cow's milk ostipi, uh, a day at an average price of 25 zloty apiece. And he pointed out that while his own production was subject to constant health and veterinary or oversight, the production of cow's milk imitations functioned largely outside such controls. And Batza Stasek, from a village in, in the Podhalle, likewise reported that one of his own neighbors made cow's cheeses, which he sold to tourists in Zakopane. With more than a hint of bitterness, he told us that her work was clean in comparison to his own, as she didn't tend the cows herself, but simply purchased milk for her cheese from other villagers with livestock. And what seemed to annoy him the most was the fact that she got to, and I quote him here, sleep in her own bed every night while he and his Yuhasi had to spend the season dislocated from his home and family, grazing and milking sheep in all weathers, keeping a lookout for wolves at night, and living in a wooden shepherd's hut with only the most basic amenities. And so she pastoralists or shepherds felt that they faced unfair competition from smallholders who saturated the market with these kinds of cow's milk cheeses. Um, and this is a, a quote from our interview with the uh, Avata and Kormatic. Um, today money rules, you understand. Today people don't respect Abatsa and his work, even during the six months they ought to. Respect from others, to others. Respect for the Ostebek, because today there's so many of these cow's milk Ostebeks. And again, that's how they talk about us, the cow's milk Ostebek. Do you understand? That is how the market is. You want to sell an Ostebek or a Brinza Podhalanska, which are European products, <clears throat> you know, which means they have the, the designation PDO. But you won't sell them, because around you there's already competition who's able to set their price even 10 zloty less, and people go for that. So certification was meant to elevate the value of Ostebeck beyond simple market, market logic, beyond supply and demand, tying it instead to positively valued notions of territory and cultural heritage. And yet Maddox found himself faced with strident commercial competition from rival producers of avatar products and a consumer base more interested in price than in quality. And according to Shepherds, the widespread reluctance amongst consumers to pay premium quality, uh, pay for, the, for premium quality, was partly grounded in their lack of recognition of the superior taste and texture of original Ostebeck. So that's a stack. Uh, told us that most of his villagers were accustomed to most of his visit, visitors were accustomed to eating and uh, eating the cow's milk, eating and referring to locally available cow's milk cheeses as Ostebeck. And when he tried, uh, when they tried the PDO certified version for the first time, their reaction was either one of awe or of disbelief and accusation of trickery on his part because they are accustomed to the taste of the cow's milk cheese, they would argue that his ostipi were not authentic because they knew the taste of real ostipic they bought it many times while traveling in the region. 
And Dr. Futsuan from the Port Hala told us that not only do consumers very rarely look or acquire for proof of PDO certification, but they're generally not able to distinguish between different types of locally made hard cheeses, let alone able to determine whether Ostebeck has been made according to a certified recipe. Everything they see, be it traditional product or regional product, they call everything Ostebeck, every single one. This, that, or the other, he doesn't know. We've been driving home the point for 12 years now, and nothing. All the radio and television interviews, all the fairs in Poland and abroad. Uh, we've been going to the fair in Berlin for a few years now to sell Ser Gastowski, and this is what they make in the winter, so uh, 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 cow's cheese. Um, but everyone keeps saying Ostebeck, Ostebeck, so you know, they're referring to it as Ostebeck. And we saw this as well when we were doing field work. Uh, uh, we were uh, in, in Ochotnica, and one Saturday afternoon, uh, a kind of classic motorcycle rally passed through, and it made a plan to stop. <coughs> in the village, and the local uh, Batsa Buczek set up a stall on the site offering smoked and unsmoked cheeses in different sizes, including PDO certified Ostsipki and Gopi and Sepki Buraske. And he bought with him a, a charcoal grill allowing him to serve the small cheeses uh, grilled uh, with, with cranberry jam. And his stall was really popular. Uh, with the participants and with the spectators, but no matter what the, his customers ordered, they referred to their choice as Ostsebeck. So they'd point to a chosen item and say, I'd like the small, unsmoked Ostsebeck, or I'd like the medium-sized Ostsebeck, please. So for these consumers, Ostsebeck wasn't the name of a regional specialty cheese, but just a generic name for any cheese coming from the mountains. And if you look at consumer research, uh, which tries to understand Polish consumers' appetite for and attitudes towards geographical indication, um, it shows pretty much that this is a typical state of affairs. So I found a recent survey uh, which showed that two-thirds of those who purchased regional cheeses expressed no interest in knowing how they were produced or by whom, and half declared themselves unwilling to pay a higher price for anything with a PDO or PGI label. And research shows that Polish consumers do confer a uh, higher value to products that are understood to be rooted in local cuisines, but that they, un they understand and interpret terms like traditional or regional uh, in a way that differs from the definitions adopted by the EU and by national legal acts. So things like traditional tend to be you know, connected intuitively with things like what's familiar, what's handmade, uh, what has a traditional recipe, uh, what's made like my grandmother makes it, and not necessarily this, these kinds of ideas of tevla or, or other things. So while the presence of uh, geographical indications may reinforce a consumer's perception of the foods as traditional and authentic, um, they see these qualities as extrinsic and, not, and independent to certification, so not necessarily linked to certification itself. Um, and I think there's, you know, this means that this relatively weak association between GI labeling and ideas of authenticity and tradition and heritage leaves the field relatively open for rival producers uh, or rival products to appropriate some of the same symbols and social meanings. And this is, you know, clear in this Nekovita range of, of industrially produced cheeses where there's, you know, a clear symbolic connection to, to the mountains and to kind of Buddha culture and, and Zakopane. Um, so the current promotion of Ostebeck itself doesn't do very much. Oh, this is just a, a stall. This is uh, one, of, one of the, uh, the stalls that is, is run by one of the shepherds. Um, <clears throat> just to show. So the current promotion uh, of Ostepec does little to create a stronger link between the idea of the PDO status and quality and authenticity. So if shepherds are obliged to legally display their certificate proving that they're entitled to make PDO Ostepec in their Batsufka, this isn't a particularly exciting document. It's, it's just a, a one page with text. Um, so it's not something that's going to catch the eye of a tourist necessarily. Very few buses display the PDO logo in any prominent way in their promotional material, if they have any promotional material, uh, in their packaging or anywhere near their properties. And the PDO logo is really hard to find on the website of the producers' cooperative, uh, Gazovia. Um, 
even though the fact that its members were instrumental in actually gaining the designation um, for the cheese. So I actually had a look at the front side of their website, and you have to scroll all the way down to the bottom to even see a tiny little logo. Um, so they're not using it, in a sense, to, to link it to their products in, in any particular way. And this doesn't mean that Ostapec isn't supported along official channels. Um, as I've already pointed out, you have these festivals of Ostapec cheeses, um, <clears throat> and you have the Schlag um, which is, you know, uh, again, supported by, by uh, the uh, Lesser Poland region. Um, but if you notice again here, no kind of link to PDO, no link to the geographical indication um, on their map that they've made here, even though all of these places are places where you can buy PDO certified, and only places where you buy PDO, PDO certified uh, Ostinic. And this is how it's presented to me, in a sense. Um, I can't read it. <laughs> Um, so in a sense, uh, there, there isn't much of a, a, a connection here made, you know, specifically uh, between between cheeses and and the PDO certification. Um, there's lots of other ways that Ostebeck is used uh, as as uh, a kind of logo, um, either here for for um, for Gazdovia, but also in terms of promoting different regional cities and, and the region itself. Um, so it's, it's definitely a kind of image, it has a, a kind of brand value, the cheese itself. And in a sense, Osterberg perhaps has